Hi everyone and welcome to week 6 of the IDs B10 course and this week we're talking about open education and development. I hope you all did well on the quiz and that you have had the time to review some of the readings for this week. So I'm going to discuss a few key questions during this uh, brief lecture. I'll talk a little bit about what characterizes higher education mm -hmm. systems in the developing world. Of course, this is a very broad question and I'll only be able to touch on some uh, general trends and um, give you a little uh, bit of a uh, feel for some of the problems that these systems might be facing. We're going to talk about uh, different theories of um, the role of education in society and this will link up to one of the readings that you had this week. We'll talk about one possible out of many uh, possible solutions or things that can uh, support a better education in uh, developing and developed the countries and we will then discuss um, the issue of whether these resources are culturally and linguistically appropriate and finally briefly touch upon ways of using these resources and uh, what we call open and informal learning so first, if we start by discussing higher education systems in the developing world. Again, uh, the developing world is uh, very large and there are very big um, individual differences, but there are some common trends in many of these. Um, many countries are ex-colonies and the educational systems were typically built during the colonial time by the colonial uh, the colonial masters. Uh, this had often a very strong impact on the uh, educational systems that came afterwards. For example, in um, most of Africa, m education is typically done in a colonial language, not in a local language. Um, this is especially the case for university, where there's barely a single university in Africa that actually teaches using an African language. Almost all universities use English, French, Portuguese, um, or of course Arabic or, or Afrikaans, uh, which is uh, closely related to Dutch, but not local languages. And even for high school and secondary school and so on, um, you know, there, there's very little use of local languages. And of course, this comes from a number of reasons. Uh, one is that a country might have a number of different local languages and they've chosen to standardize. Um, one is that the system started out in the colonial language. One is that a lot of the development aid might be given still from the countries that used to have colonial relationships and might come in the form of, for example, free textbooks. But of course, these textbooks then are in French or English, not in the local languages. Um, in addition, locals might actually prefer um, the colonial language education because during co the colonial time it was common that the schools taught in colonial languages were the prestigious universities or, or high schools where the elite kids and the kids of the, uh, of the colonial masters went whereas they might have set up what they called Bantu schools in, 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 Afri in South Africa, uh, these very, very low um, quality and, and, low, and schools with very low prestige in local languages. And so after liberation, um, parents would say, you know, we want the best for our kids, and the best is these Western-style schools, and so we don't want to settle with something less. Either way, um, there are, of course, advantages and disadvantages to this, um, there are huge disadvantages in, in the sense that um, kids um, are not able to learn as effectively. They often are not able to connect what they're learning with their, lo with their uh, personal lives. Um, oftentimes the teachers are not even as comfortable in these languages. And this does not only affect how much the students learn, but it actually changes the entire way that the um, school is organized, uh, the classroom is organized, because if you're teaching in a language that you're not comfortable in, um, you are much less likely to have an open approach where you discuss with the students, and the students are much less likely to um, dare to ask questions or to discuss, 
and uh, you're much more likely to uh, recite from a book, write on the blackboard, have the students copy and memorize and so on. So this has a really wide-reaching uh, implication. Of course, on the other hand, um, you know, grasping a European language well gives students potentially access to a much larger um, base of knowledge. And so uh, there are advantages and disadvantages, but um, this is a very important issue in many um, developing countries, not all by far. Uh, when you look at the universities as well, they were typically started for the very small elite. Um, and here you could have some interesting economic discussions because oftentimes these universities are um, very cheap or even provided for free. And although that might seem like a very equitable thing to do, the fact is that typically uh, it's very difficult to get into these universities unless you've gone to perhaps uh, expensive private schools or so on. And what ends up happening is that it is the elite children who are admitted to the university and yet they do not have to pay. And of course the university is not, you know, somebody has to pay for it. And of course that money comes from the general tax income. So the result becomes that the entire working class of the country subsidizes the rich children. Now, that's certainly not always the case, and, um, and I'm not arguing that necessarily uh, charging high school fees is uh, providing uh, better equity, but it does go to show that you have to examine these kind of questions very critically, and you have to use um, the different theories that you learn in this, uh, in this course and in these programs whether it's economics or sociology or anthropology, and really question um, you know, the effect of different policies rather than being um, ideologically wedded to, to certain ways of um, approaching things. Um, now, as I mentioned before, the content. So um, in addition to often thinking that Western uh, knowledge is superior, has a higher status, um, you know, the the result often becomes that the, uh, and of course the fact that they are reusing, oftentimes donated school books, they're accessing web pages generated in the West and so on, and uh, school children might often spend a lot of time learning uh, information that is not very relevant to their own lives or their own country. Um, in Indonesia, as an example, where I did my IDS um, placement and I studied um, the provision of rural libraries, I found that uh, up until quite recently, librarians who uh, wanted to get a university certificate actually took the British university exam. And of course, as you can imagine, the challenges that librarians uh, face in England with a very literate population, with quite a, a wealthy uh, government, are vastly different from those faced in Indonesia. And of course, almost all the uh, library students ended up writing student theses about digital libraries. And while digital libraries are very interesting, um, in a situation where most uh, people in Indonesia uh, do not have access to computers and where there is an incredible lack of even basic library services at the village or even the city level. Uh, that seems like a little bit of a, of a misguided focus, but this is something that uh, can commonly occur. Another example is the huge uh, brain drain of doctors from many developing countries. And it has been suggested that the fact that medical education internationally has been so streamlined um, is one of the reasons for this. So even if you're training to be a doctor in Ethiopia, uh, you will still perhaps use an international curriculum that teaches you about cancer, about high blood pressure, about um, you know brain tumors and stuff like that. Whereas perhaps um, you know a large percent of the children are dying because of malnutrition or diarrhea or other things. Um, so this means that it's quite easy for you to immigrate to the U.S. And, and immediately go to work in a very advanced hospital treating what we call developed world problems. Um, but you might not be the most appropriate person to deal with issues in your own country. Um, one final uh, thing which uh, is, is an interesting 
uh, challenge perhaps to some of these trends is what uh, in some countries has been known as mega universities. Uh, and these are oftentimes, these are usually based on distance education. And they're, especially China and India both stand out as having these mega universities. In China, there's a university now called the Open University of China, which has something like 2.7 million students. And in India, there's the Indira Gandhi National Open University with more than 2 million students. Their model is that they create course module, modules centrally by teams of experts. And, there are, and these models, by the way, are often modeled on the Open University of uh, UK, um, which is kind of a world leader in this field. And they then have thousands of local study centers. Um, now, some of the education happens through either old-fashioned letter mail. They will mail you some material. You might have to send a letter to your teacher. You call your teacher. Uh, or, you know, um, now internet is being used more and more. And then these local study centers provide face-to-face -face support. Uh, you might have to go in there to do tests or to use equipment that you wouldn't have at home. And so it makes education much more widely available. You don't have to move into the big cities and um, and also uh, far more affordable and uh, more accessible for people who want to, uh, for example, who are working full-time and still want to get an education. And uh, that's actually a really interesting topic if any of you are interested in looking into it. So that's uh, some of the challenges. And uh, again, this is a very, very brief overview that uh, many um, educational systems in the developing world are facing. Now, a key question when we're talking about uh, education, and especially as we're talking about that from a perspective of development, um, I mean, we're not teachers in this class. So when we're talking about education, we want to know what's its relationship with um, development. And to start unpacking that, we have to look at what's called the sociology of education. And there's actually um, a course offered, it used to be offered at UTSC called the sociology of education. And if you find this interesting, um, I'd, rec I'd recommend that you look that up. Basically, sociology of education asks the question, what is the social impact of, and I write learning here, but I really should say education. And what's the difference between learning and education? You could say that learning happens constantly. Um, and it can happen at so many different levels. You could learn how to ski. You could be in a, a workplace and you gradually get better at your job. Uh, a, a little child can learn from her grandmother. Education is the organized form of, of learning, or ideally it, it leads to learning. It doesn't have to. Um, and it's, it's um, a system that's organized by society. And typically societies spend incredibly amounts of resources, um, both in terms of the money provided, in terms of the amount of uh, people involved in it as teachers, as administrators, as students, um, and in the efforts to regulate it, the amount of laws that are passed, quality approval, and so on. It's a very uh, controlled uh, system. And, of course, the question we have to ask ourselves is, uh, what is the purpose and what are the actual outcomes or effects? Um, and... Uh, if you look at something called uh, human capital theory, that was that's the idea that that uh, you can invest in education at the same way as you invest in, um, for example, building better highways or uh, expanding your factory. Basically, an investment, uh, although we use that word very loosely, is something that gives a return on investment. Now, if you look at different kinds of, of uh, government spending, um, for example, the government of Canada spends a lot of money on pensions. Um, now, pensions cannot be seen as an investment because it's money that's given out and it's spent and it gives better life quality for some people. And that's absolutely valuable, but it's not something that directly gives um, any, any money back in the future. However, if you look at, for example, healthcare, you could you could actually look at that as investment, because a country um, with a sick population um, will not be very productive. So if you if you have a very effect or a, a country where a person has to wait for three years 
before they get an operation, um, or a country where private companies have to spend a lot of money on healthcare, and that's the case in the U.S., for example, um, might not be as as efficient. So, in addition to saying that spending on healthcare is a moral imperative, it's something you should do, it's something people have a right to. You can also say from an economic perspective that it might actually make sense. It might save you money in the long run. And and, and this is exactly the same argument that began uh, being made, I think, around the 60s uh, for education. And it was a big shift. Uh, going from seeing education as kind of a social perk, as something that we give people because they deserve it, because it enriches their lives, because uh, it helps their personal growth, we see it as it's actually a very wise economic decision because a country that spends of its collective wealth um, on furthering education is a country that's going to get ahead economically. So if we, um, so that was a, uh, a very important theory and it led to a widespread um, investment in, in uh, education around the world. In fact, that was kind of the time when uh, Ontario Institute for Studies in Education, where I am a student, was uh, was started with a large funding from the Ontario government, who perhaps wanted to invest in education in Ontario to become economically competitive. And today we kind of take this for granted because we're so used to hearing it. But when this theory was first propounded, it really was a new way of looking at education. And of course, some people still think that this is too uh, callous and heartless to, to talk about education, something that you'll get a, a return of investment in and, and that you should rather talk about it as a, as a human right. But uh, you don't necessarily have to choose. However, the picture becomes more complicated because it's not given that this theory holds up and certainly not that it holds up in all contexts and, and uh, settings. Um, you know, so what, you know, so... You can look at um, you can look at the question of what, how much value does education add to a person's life, and especially its economic life. And we're going to talk mostly about higher education in this case, although you could discuss this for other forms of education too. Now you can look at this in many different ways. One way would be to take ten people who went to Harvard and ten people who um, did not go to Harvard, and are the people who went to Harvard making more money uh, in in the rest of their lives than the people who did not go to Harvard? And that might very well be the case, statistically speaking. In that case, it seems like Harvard has, even though har going to Harvard is very, very expensive, seems like it pays off because these people are um, have gained something through their training that makes them able to earn much more money. And by extension, the government earns more tax money and so is justified in investing money in this in this um, education. However, another way of looking at it would be to say, actually, Harvard has a very rigorous selection process. Harvard only selects the best students. In fact, the students selected by Harvard would probably have been successful anyway. So, even if they had not gone to Harvard, they would still have earned more money than anyone else. Well, in that case, the Harvard education had no value at all. And, of course, um, any there would be no reason for those individuals to pay for going to Harvard or for the state to subsidize them going to Harvard. A third case could be what we call the sheepskin effect. That is, the fact that someone has a credential from Harvard... Uh, that shows that they were selected actually means that they will get better jobs because uh, companies believe that they are smarter. Whether they are smarter or not, we don't know. Um, but they actually still don't have to learn anything during those four years. Um, they'll still get they all they have to do is is get that certificate. In this case, it makes a lot of sense for those individuals to pay for going to the school because after all, that certificate which they are getting is the difference. And for them individually, it means that they make more money. However, it would not make any sense for the government to subsidize um, people going to Harvard because um, 
the actual productivity in the in the whole country has not been increased then you have another theory saying in fact the difference between people going to harvard and and other people is not so much what they learn it's who they study with and it's perhaps the way they learn how to talk how to walk um, how to behave and this is the social enculturation theory so um, a lot of, for example, a lot of uh, Washington firms uh, who want to hire lobbyists want to hire people from prestigious schools because they're very comfortable around powerful and rich people. They know how to, you know, discuss interesting topics, and they might have gone to school with a lot of interesting people who then became uh, become powerful and famous, and so they have a very uh, wide network of contacts. Now, I'm not going to tell you which of these theories are correct or wrong, and probably all of them, to some extent, explain what's going on. Uh, and it's a continual research project to figure out exactly um, which apply in what, what cases. But try to keep these different perspectives on the value of education in mind, and they will be really useful when we later look at this idea of open educational resources. So I'm going to briefly talk about open educational resources. This is something that I've spent a lot of time looking at. And if you're interested, you'll find numerous presentations on this topic on my blog, um, as well as, of course, by many other people. Now, the idea for open educational resources really came from the open source movement, which is um, has to do with computer programs. And it's the idea that computer programs um, should not only be free of cost, they should actually be free as in speech, is the way people uh, put it. What that means is, you know, if you have an um, uh, Internet Explorer, let's say, it's free of cost. Nobody paid for Internet Explorer. Anyone can go to Microsoft's web page and download it. However, by downloading it, you don't get any rights as a user, apart from the fact that you can use it. Um, for most of you, that might be enough. But let's say you were the Indian government, and there are about 20 official languages in India, and you wanted to make sure that they all had access to surf the internet in their local languages. And you realized that that would not be um, economically feasible for Microsoft to do themselves. So you said, we will take our responsibility as a national government, and we will subsidize, we will pay for the translation of this software to all those languages. Well, you know, you still couldn't do it because micro unless Microsoft agreed to take your money because all you get when you download Internet Explorer is an executable file. Um, you can't open it. You can't see how it's made. You can't change it. In fact, you're not even allowed to distribute it. If your friend wants it, he has to go to the same website and download it, he or, he or she. Now, open source is different. The idea is that you use these open licenses that expressly give you permission to look at the source code so you can see how they wrote the program. You can uh, modify it, you can distribute it, and that meant that uh, Firefox, which is open source as opposed to uh, Internet Explorer, it would anyone could actually, for example, translate or modify in any way. And that's exactly what the Indian government did. They took um, Firefox and OpenOffice, which is uh, similar to Microsoft Office, but it's open source, and they had it translated into a number of languages and that enabled uh, a lot of people in India to use computers who were not, never able to do so before. The open source movement has been tremendously successful. In fact, most of the servers on the internet run on open source software, including servers at Google, at Yahoo, etc. And this has also inspired a lot of other movements on the, on the internet and uh, or in the world in general. And one of these was around educational resources. Now, first we have to say, what's an educational resource? Um, and this has to do with granularity. So granularity means how big or small uh, something is. Now, you could call a textbook a resource. You could call a movie a resource. Um, but something that became interesting to a lot of people were thinking about how small could we make resources 
um, could we make resources kind of like Lego blocks so that you could, if you were creating a new course, kind of assemble. Um, I want a little bit of this, I want a little bit of this, and you kind of put it together and you create a new course. Um, one of the things that they found is that there is a challenge when it comes to how contextual something else is. So if you have, you know, something that's completely decontextualized, so for example, a picture, um, it's very easy to integrate it in with other resources, but it becomes much more, it actually does not have as much value for learning. So the more contextualized a resource is, the more useful it becomes for learning, but the harder it becomes to integrate with other resources. And that's something that people are still struggling with. Either way, um, with the advent of um, Creative Commons licenses, which we will talk a bit more about later in this course, um, several universities and other institutions began experimenting with publishing open educational resources. And one of the most famous one is uh, the MIT OpenCourseWare, which put almost all of their courses online for free, um, and which inspired universities around the world. I think about 40 different countries um, are covered right now with lots of different languages and so on. Um, there's a lot of different institutions who put their resources online, lots of individuals. And um, recently in the US, the Department of I wrote education here. In fact, it's the Department of Labor, um, which launched a huge initiative uh, giving grants to community colleges um, about uh, at, at several hundred million dollars to create uh, learning materials for retraining workers that have been laid off during the economic crisis. And they required that all of these resources would be licensed openly. So that's a huge win for the open education movement and it's it's a very exciting um, exciting um, development and as I mentioned this isn't just something happening in North America there's a in fact I wrote my master's thesis about a massive project in China that led to the pr production of 12,000 open university courses um, there are lots of interesting uh, movements um, in India, in Indonesia, South Africa Mexico and so on. Um, so, if you, I hope you had a look at the blog posts which I posted as extra resources during this week, and in them you'll see that there is some criticism of the open educational resources movement for developing countries, where they're saying, you know, this is just another example of Western institutions. Um, flooding the market with um, resources that are very Western-centric. And um, that's a valid criticism. However, one of the important points of the open educational resources movement, as opposed to, you know, Pearson, let's say, putting up a website, is that people can actually modify these. And so, and what's important is not only that they use uh, open licenses, but also ideally that they use file formats that can be edited. And this seems like a, a small detail, but if someone puts up a PDF, um, even if they let you change it, it's a lot harder to actually change it than if someone puts up, let's say, a Word document. Um, and so the idea is to have um, local institutions modifying, um, translating, and making uh, materials appropriate to the populations that they serve. Um, tr so far, there has been quite a lot of work on translation. Uh, however, the work of localizing probably is not as advanced, and it's also probably a lot more difficult to do. And the other thing is, uh, which the internet enables is hopefully for this flow of knowledge to not only go in one direction. Um, I showed last week in my video the the online course from MIT alongside with the online course from India Institute of Technology. So, uh, and I know, for example, that Tufts Medical School is uh, using several open resources on tropical medicine that was developed at universities in Africa, which are, are facing these issues on a daily basis. So there, is, there are some unprecedented opportunities for 
uh, universities in the north and in the global south to work together and for universities in the north to be humble and really treasure and um, and appreciate the resources that are being made around the world and I think we still have a, a long ways to go there um, but it's certainly something that is enabled by the use of open educational resources. Um, finally Talking so much about resources, of course, there's a question about how these resources actually work and how they can be used. Um, they can either be aid to teachers, so in you know, in university instructors, high school teachers can find resources that are appropriate to their class and uh, present them to the students. And, and there are some efforts being made at how to train teachers, how to build competency in finding and in reusing these uh, resources. And there's also um, the focus on individual learners. So if I'm a, a person who um, wants to learn something, um, I'm not in a class, I don't have a teacher, how do I go about doing that? Um, how can we support individual learners to find the right resources, to find other people uh, that want to learn together with them to perhaps find mentors um, and one effort at doing this is called peer-to-peer -peer university um, which I helped start a few years ago uh, which is kind of a Wikipedia for learning so anyone can go there and start a course um, using open resources there's a community of people who help out people can then join the course and everyone helps each other learn now this is something that we're just beginning to experiment with. And there are lots of open research questions. Um, how, to, how can we make this as efficient as possible? How can we really support people? Uh, but it's a very exciting experiment, and I invite you to have a look at what's going on there. And finally, of course, um, if people actually learn uh, through, these, through these platforms and, and using these resources, how can they get some kind of a recognition that they can then use to um, apply for jobs, for example? So, looking at you know the potential for open educational resources to have a real impact on um, educational systems in the developing and in the developed world, I think it's crucial to go back to the initial theories that we mentioned um, If we look at the sociology of education, right? If we believe that human capital theory is right and that an investment in uh, human educate human learning, if individuals actually learn to do things better, to have better knowledge, better skills, that in itself um, will lead to higher economic productivity for the whole country. If we believe that, then open educational resources and online learning communities can be an incredible boon to developing countries and all countries. Of course, uh, this presumes that there is appropriate resources for their culture, their country, their language, and it presumes that they have access uh, to these resources, whether that means internet access or it means having devices. And of course, we talked about this in previous weeks, but it's something that could have a lot of value. However, if we take the very cynical credentialism theory, which states that there are, there's an equal amount of, of skilled jobs available, and uh, basically, uh, you know, taking more and more schooling is is almost a way of um, cold war uh, armaments, where you know the person who has the highest uh, diploma gets the job, but actually the all the schooling and all the money that was spent on it uh, didn't really. Um, improve his or her economic um, productivity. Well, in that case, open educational resources will not be really helpful. And in fact, they will. Pro if we're talking about social enculturation or education as a filtering system, um, open educational resources would not help individuals become more competitive uh, in a developing country because taking a course at peer-to-peer -peer university will probably never be able to compete with Harvard in terms of prestige, even if a person who works hard at it can learn a whole, a whole amount. So this is already long enough. I'm going to stop here, but I hope that I've given you some, some interesting ideas and 
and, and perspectives and ways of analyzing this. Um, I'd love to hear from you, I mean, especially people who perhaps grew up abroad or have traveled widely, um, what you've seen of, of education systems around the world, not just in developing or developed countries. I mean, I come from Norway. I know that many things uh, in the University of Norway is very different from Canada. Um, and whether you think that um, open educational resources could, could uh, be one way of, of uh, improving education. If you're interested in learning more about these topics, as I mentioned before, there is a huge amount of material available about open educational resources. And given that they're open, I really recommend you to go out and have a look yourself. I mean, these might be helpful in your own learning, and there's nothing, there's no substitute to actually going out and exploring these resources by yourself. I'd love to hear also what you think about them. So I'll end there and have a, have a great weekend.